Hi, this is Jorgen Rasmus, and welcome to the Provocative Hypnosis Vlog. Today's episode is about the work of William Glasser, what he called choice theory, something that was also called reality therapy before 1998. As you know, if you follow my channel, I like to, to make these videos about the people whose work has deeply influenced me, where I go through what I perceive to be the strengths and the weaknesses of those particular approaches, frameworks, and philosophies. So in this episode, as I said, the topic is William Glasser's choice theory. Now, uh, William Glasser, I was first introduced to his work uh, pretty much exactly 20 years ago in 2003 and it's been deeply influential to the work that I do. And I highly recommend that you check out William Glasser's work if you haven't. He was a psychiatrist, but he was an extremely unusual psychiatrist in that he rejected the whole notion of mental illness. Now, there are other honest psychiatrists who have done the same. Thomas Sauce being one brilliant example of someone who uh, um, helped people see that the whole notion of mental illness was a myth. Peter Bregan is another psychiatrist who, 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 who does the same, is still alive. But uh, Glasser, as a psychiatrist, rejected the whole framework of mental illness. And he was all about choice, freedom, and personal responsibility which is extremely uncommon for a psychiatrist because if you look at psychiatry and the history of psychiatry and the function that psychiatry very often serves in society as a kind of form of state-sanctioned social control masquerading as medicine, psychiatry largely functions as an assault on personal freedom and personal responsibility. And here you have a guy like Glasser who, who champions exactly that. So let me uh, quote Glasser from his 1998 book, Choice Theory, just to give you a, a little bit of an idea of, of what this was about. So, so here it goes. Suppose you could ask all the people in the world who are not hungry, sick, or poor, people who seem to have a lot to live for, to give you an honest answer to the question, how are you? Millions would say, I'm miserable. If asked why, almost all of them would blame someone else for their misery. Lovers, wives, husbands, exes, children, parents, teachers, students, or people they work with. There's hardly a person alive who hasn't been heard saying, you're driving me crazy. That really upsets me. Don't you have any consideration for how I feel? You make me so mad, I can't see straight. It never crosses their minds that they are choosing the misery that they are complaining about. Choice theory explained that for all practical purposes, we choose everything we do, including the misery we feel. Other people can neither make us miserable nor make us happy. All we can get from them or give to them is information. But by itself, information cannot make us do or feel anything. It goes into our brains where we process it and then decide what to do. Quite radical, although shares some commonalities there with typical cognitive behavioral therapies, such as Aaron Beck's CBT or Albert Ellis's Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy or systems such as ACT or Metacognitive Therapy, Neuro Linguistic Programming. This whole idea that it's not so-called external events in and of themselves, but it's how we interpret them and make sense of them and what we choose to do in response to that that largely determines or experience and our quality of life. So Glasser's, one of Glasser's big things was, was that he, once again, he, he rejected the whole mental illness frame. So even though he worked as a psychiatrist, 
he did not accept the patient role or him being a therapist role. He, he rejected the idea that people who have these mental illness diagnoses are sick in any literal way. This is a typo, typical Glasser analogy. So one analogy that, I, that he used is one where he made a distinction between physical health and mental health, even though he was clear that what we call the, the, the body and the psyche is, is part of an integrated system. But, but he said that, look, if you go to the doctor with a physical complaint, he or she is going to run through you, run you through all sorts of tests. And if the tests come back negative, there's no infection, there's no structural abnormality anywhere, there's no broken bone, you're not going to get a medical diagnosis of being having a disease, but you, you might say that you're physically out of shape and the doctor an ethical doctor, ideally, might then help you improve your physical fitness through focusing on sleep and diet and exercise and exposure to sunlight and better relationships and stress reduction and so on and so forth. But if you take the whole mental illness field, in according to Glasser, you know, if, if, if you have a an actual disease, it's going to be a brain disease such as uh, epilepsy or Parkinson's or having a brain tumor or something like that. But if the physician can't find any brain pathology, but you're unhappy and you have symptoms, you then get labeled as so-called mentally ill and told that you have an, an illness just like a physical illness and that you need to be treated. And there's often not that much you can do for yourself. You're essentially a victim of circumstance or brain chemistry or, or, or faulty genetics. This whole framework is what Glasser rallied against. He, he would say that, look, people develop what you might call symptoms. They're depressing, they're anxietizing, they're phobicking, they're obsessing because they're unhappy. And they're unhappy because they're basically irresponsible and the way they, they try to achieve their perceived needs is not working well for them. And as Glasser would point out, if people are seriously unhappy for prolonged periods of time, they have a tendency, and this is just the brain's creativity, to begin to generate symptoms as a way of trying to um, satisfy their needs and to deal with their unhappiness. So the role then of the choice theory practitioner is to help people to essentially see that they are choosing this and to make better choices in terms of satisfying their needs. So with Glasser's choice theory, and I think this is one of the big strengths of it, is not accepting this whole mental illness frame, meaning that unless there's any proof of an actual brain disease, something being wrong with the brain, there's no reason to uh, diagnose people as ill of having an, an, an illness. Uh, another big strength of Glasser's model is that he really had no patience with people's past. He, he didn't dig into people's past history. There was no emphasis on analyzing dreams or free association or, or uh, being a transference uh, figure. Uh, his role as a therapist would be to help people to, again, as I said, become more responsible, help them see how they're choosing their misery and helping them to develop better choices. So his way of working was very present oriented and very future um, oriented. Now, the, the heart of Glasser's work is that he, he, he was very relationship oriented. He, he believed that our, our unhappiness was mostly, and he was kind of extreme on this one, and, but, but was mostly associated with our 
or lack of good relationships. And uh, he attributed our relationship issues to the fact that most of us seem to use something that Glasser called external control psychology. And if you look around you, you'll, you'll be able to verify this for yourself. And, and the whole basis of external control psychology rests on three, three kind of implicit beliefs. One being that you can make me feel. You know, it, it's what you say, it's what you do that, 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 that kind of makes me feel unhappy or happy. The second kind of implicit belief is that, you know, I can, I can control you. You know, I can make you happy or I can make you miserable. And, 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 and the third kind of belief being that as a result of that, um, I kind of know what's best for you. And I'm kind of almost obligated to, to force you, to, to coerce you, to, to do what I think is right. And you'll, you'll see this in marriages, you'll see this in relationships, that, 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 that people have a tendency to, to use what Glasser called the deadly habits of external control psychology. Criticizing, nagging, blaming, uh, rewarding kind of like rewarding people as a dog when 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 they do what you want them to do threatening trading drama these sorts of things and glasser would emphasize how the use of external control psychology tends to kill intimacy and trust and ruin relationships and then people kind of have a tendency to increase their use of external control and and he would do his best to help people see this to, to to see how this external control psychology actually does not lead to richer relationships and to replace it with these more supportive habits of listening supporting respecting encouraging uh negotiating differences you know these these sorts of things um see what else we have here um he, he had this idea that we choose everything we do and that all behaviors are total behaviors. So he viewed, you know, what people usually think of as depression or anxiety or a phobia or a migraine. People describe these as, as nouns, as something that's just kind of happening to you. One thing I really like about Glasser's work is that he, he would actively use language that, that, that presupposed this to be processes. So, so he would talk about depressing and he, he, he would have, he would encourage clients to use that language as well. So instead of I'm suffering from a depression, he would have people think of it as I'm depressing, I'm relating to my life in a depressing way, or I'm anxietizing, or I'm angering, or I'm phobicking, or obsessing, or paining, or migraining, or back aching. And this, this is kind of novel for people, it's kind of surprising to them, but it's actually way more accurate. These aren't things. The, these are actually processes that we do. Now, a lot of people respond strongly to this in a negative way, and they say, what the hell are, are, are you suggesting that I'm choosing my depression? I'm not choosing my depression. This is just happening to me. And Glasser would use a, a car analogy where he would say, look, you have the two front wheels that you can kind of control or manipulate or navigate, and then you have the back wheels that kind of follow the, the front wheels. So in the front, he would have behaviors, like, like what you do specifically, what you say and how you move and activities you, you do, and then... He would also have, you know, what you focus on, what you attend to, you know, the way you think. 
And then the back wheels would represent feelings or emotions and physiology. So he would say, look, it's very hard to directly change a feeling or to directly change the physiology, but you can directly change your behavior or the way you think and thereby indirectly change your physiology and your behavior. And he would point out that, that all behaviors are total behaviors. They contain these four elements. So depressing then has a certain physiology, certain feeling states, but also certain behaviors and ways of attending and thinking. Just like reading is a total behavior. You know, you, you hold the book, you, you move your eyes across the page, you know, you, you kind of get absorbed into what you read. Those are like the voluntary components. And then you might have certain feelings and things may happen in your physiology as a result of that. So you're choosing the total behavior of reading or running in the same way that you're choosing the total behavior of painting or depressing. This has been one of the most useful concepts for me in my work in helping clients because once you can view what you used to view as a symptom, you know, uh, <coughs> excuse me, as something completely involuntary, this offers so much more choice. Now, of course, the whole, the whole, so one big strength with this particular uh, choice theory framework is that it's very simple, it's very straightforward. And Glasser was known as a very efficient therapist, extremely skilled in helping people change. And his first book, Reality Therapy, was based up, was largely, or, or to a large extent, based up on work he had done with juvenile delinquents, you know, young teenagers, especially young teenage girls who committed crime and did a lot of, you know, crazy stuff. And, and, and he had a lot, of, a lot of success with those, just teaching them a better philosophy of life, focusing on choice and responsibility and holding them accountable and, and teaching them better ways to uh, satisfy their perceived needs. And I've had quite a few successes as well, even though I don't prefer to work with teenagers, but... Working with teenagers and young adults who may be depressing and anxietizing and phobicking and doing chronic fatiguing and chronic paining, you know, many of them aren't that psychologically oriented yet. Their their ability to self-reflect and, and, and to see themselves as storytellers and, and stuff like that, uh, and to be and to have a lot of responsibility might be limited. So it might be tricky to try to get too philosophical or too psychological, but by focusing on behavior, but by helping a young person to see that, wait a minute, you're choosing the total behavior of depressing. There's things you're doing, ways you're attending, and there's feelings, and there's physiology. So I, I, with a young person who's depressing, for example, I might have them look at these typical behaviors such as, are, are, you, are you moving your body on a daily basis? Like your, your ratio of being active versus being passive. Are you prioritizing sleep? Are, are you getting sunlight? Are, are you doing something social? Are you doing something altruistic? I'll, I'll task them with different behaviors and different ways of attending and intending and focusing and have them noticing how these choices influence their feelings and their physiology, for example. Um, so this has been extremely useful. Now, according to Glasser, people do what they do to satisfy their, their needs. And, and according to Glasser and choice theory, uh, we have five needs, uh, which was Glasser thought of as survival, uh, love and can, love and belonging, uh, which he kind of really emphasized, uh, fun, freedom, and power. Now, is this completely correct, like from a scientific perspective? Probably not. You know, 
it's the same way same you know a, a lot of people have these needs models you know you, you have tony robbins for example with his uh, six human needs where, where he talked about uh the needs for certainty and and uncertainty variety um significance love and connection growth and contribution you know you, you have other theorists who have different uh takes so is is this completely accurate probably not but is he on to something like is there something to it is there some use in it if you don't take it too literally yeah it kind of is you know although some people might say that no i have a you know, I have a need for, for meaning or I have a need for aesthetic beauty or passionate sex or uh, um, authenticity or honesty or, you know, people might. Now, so I, I think one weakness in Glasser's approach here is claiming this as true with a capital T and and also calling these things for needs you know one of the great uh things that albert ellis used to emphasize and uh, the one way he really helped his clients was to help them take their perceived needs their musts and needs and shoulds and 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 turn them into these preferences uh you know there, there's a world of difference between thinking that you want something or thinking that you therefore need it or must have it. So this is one of the things from Glasser that I don't tend to use or, or emphasize. I, I emphasize these things more as more as preferences. But but he's on to something. Like there's there's something to it. And his model then is that when when people fail to to satisfy these needs, they become unhappy. And if they're unhappy long enough. Uh, they may develop symptoms as a way of trying to achieve these needs or dealing with the lack of satisfying these needs. And this, once again, often provokes a lot of people. But so Glasser's take was that when people, for example, do depress, depressing or painting or anxietizing or phobicking or psychosing or whatever it might be, um, that there's usually three typical uh functions that these things serve so one function is to attempt to control other people and if you're not you know if you're willing to not be politically correct and you can be honest this is a very typical one a, a lot of people use their symptoms as ways of attempting to attempting to control other people's behaviors and and to to call clients out on that, to, to have them consider that and contemplate that and notice that uh, often provokes the crap out of people, but it, it's extremely useful and liberating. Um, a, a, another typical function it serves is to reduce their own frustration. So you, you might have the single friend who you try to you know, hook up on a date and the person says, yeah, I know I should be social, but I'm too depressed right now. So they're kind of saying in a sense that, look, I, I can deal with my current levels of frustration, but, but, but dealing with more rejection or social failure, that's too much. So I kind of prefer this. So a, a, as a way of not increasing their own frustration levels, and another one being to suppress an emotion so glasser was of the opinion for example that if we didn't have the capacity to depress that murder rates and 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 rates of violence would be way higher that sometimes people will kind of repress their own anger with depressing uh and this is also something i think is 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 very true and very often the case so when I got introduced to Glasser, I, I, I kind of had this secondary gain model and I would use hypnosis and finger signals and try to like evoke what the secondary gain might be. But I, I, I found Glasser's conversational approach so liberating where he would kind of just present these ideas to people and see which of them kind of resonated.
you know, with the client? Which one did the client kind of emotionally respond to or, or get uneasy about? And he would keep exploring from there. So th th this, this has been extremely useful too. Th th this whole idea that what we call symptoms are often a, a form of indirect communication. To his credit too, Glasser applied this even to schizophrenia and and psychosis. He he he, he acknowledged that, that that people could often use craziness as a way of of trying to satisfy their needs and if, if people lacked close relationships. So he, he offered a lot of uh, examples of working with people in these categories and still uh, rejecting the whole mental illness frame. He has this very interesting story of uh, working on a psychiatric ward and th 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 there was this very psychotic uh, client there who who was screaming, there's a monkey on my back, get that fucking monkey off my bat, back. And he'd be batshit crazy and be abusive and yell at the doctors. And and and, and, and then one day he, he called Glasser in and he said, look, there's, there's something wrong with me. And it turned out he had tuberculosis. So he, he, he was walked to the medical ward where he got medical treatment for his tuberculosis. And the people in the medical ward were like, what's he doing in psychiatry? He is the nicest, kindest, you know, guy you can meet. He's completely rational, he's lucid, his, 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 he acted completely uh, normal when he was on the medical ward and got what he wanted. And then as soon as he, as he was back in the psychiatric ward, the, the, the monkey was back on, on his back again. So... Glasser, you know, Milton Erickson, who kind of accepted the whole mental illness frame, he had a strong emphasis on kind of pacing and leading people's realities. Glasser had a very, and of course, Milton was very much into behavioral tasks and hypnosis and, and techniques, um, utilization. Glasser was kind of the opposite. He didn't really have any techniques. He, he just did conversations with people which for me was something of a mindfuck at the time when I got introduced to him because I was so into the NLP and hypnosis world where everything was about techniques. And, and, and here you have this guy who's, who's just supremely effective, but he's just kind of educating people and having conversations with them. So that kind of blew my, blew my mind as well. But, but, but Glasser would essentially not respond to their craziness. He, he would respond to their normal behavior and 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 c connect with them that way um he also he, he also emphasized what you could call the mind body connection and as i said emphasized that that you know paining back aching migraining uh fatiguing that that these sorts of things he would work with these sorts of clients too as a medical doctor and as a psychiatrist, and, and, and to view them as choices, as total behaviors. Um, he had some groups of people with rheumatoid arthritis, and according to Glasser, a lot of the patients he had in these groups with rheumatoid arthritis had remissions from the rheumatoid arthritis by learning choice theory, which to me isn't a surprise, but but for, for most people in the medical field and, and, and for, for the population at large, you know, that's, that's unheard of, uh, essentially. Let's see what, 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 what else we have here. Um, so the, the, those are many of, many of the strengths. The weaknesses, as I said, I, I, I think this whole notion about needs is a weakness. Um, I think, uh, as I pointed out with Ellis, you know, helping people to make a, a distinction between preferences, wants, wishes, and goals, and not having them turn them into needs is extremely psychologically healthy. He was probably a bit too absolutistic about that whole needs model. Um, you know, there's an analogy, too, that he called the quality world, which was, you know, the, the, the people and things that kind of matter to you. You can kind of hold that for values. Um, th that, that might be useful. 
Um, I think he was a bit too relationship oriented. He, he was kind of extreme on that. So he he didn't really offer people much in terms of helping people to relate to thoughts and feelings in different ways. You know, like like. Uh, people might do in in rational emotive behavior therapy or metacognitive therapy or various schools of of meditation uh, nothing about breathing um, so those are those are i think some of the uh, some of the limitations uh, of his work i i i i think finally i'll, I'll go through what was the the main axioms in his in his model, and just kind of offer uh, my take on these. So this is from the last chapter in Choice Theory, redefining your personal freedom. So the ten axioms of Choice Theory. So number one here, the only person whose behavior we can control is our own. In practice, if we are willing to suffer the alternative almost always severe punishment or death. No one can make us do anything we don't want to do. When we are threatened with punishment, whatever we do, we rarely do well. So I, I kind of agree with that. And, and the, uh, the, the, the second one here, all we can give or get from other people is information. How we deal with that information is our, our or their choice. Now, bearing you know government coercion or someone pinning you to the floor or uh, someone assaulting you with a weapon, you know, um, in, in the communication realm, all other people ever really do is to give us information about how they think and how things look to them, and it's how we make sense of it that ultimately determines our experience. This is a point that I strongly emphasize with, with, with clients, and Glasser was very good at, at this. Number three, all long-lasting psychological problems are relationship problems. A partial cause of many other problems, such as pain, fatigue, weakness, and some chronic diseases, commonly called autoimmune diseases, is relationship problems. I partially agree with this. So again, I think this is one of the weaknesses of Glasser's approach is, is, is this, this extreme emphasis on relationships, even though today, scientifically, uh, it is being shown that, that quality relationships really is one of the main factors in living a happy and fulfilling life. So there's every reason to, to do what you can to help people improve their relationships. But... But, 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 but this idea that all long-lasting psychological issues, it's clearly not the case. I mean, if I see someone who, who suffers with stage fright or, or fear of flying, or, or these things can be completely independent of any relationship they have in their life. And for most clients, most of the time, we don't talk about the relationships at all, unless it's like jealousy or anger issues in the relationship. So way more often, it's more useful in my experience to focus on how people relate to thoughts and feelings, their relationship to their own inner experience. And of course, that's going to influence the types of relationships that you have. But again, uh, knowing how to work with relationship issues and knowing kind of how to probe for it, uh, important. Is it, is it the main thing in long-lasting psychological problems? Uh, I think not. So, so I think Glasser was kind of mistaken on, uh, on, on that one. L let's see what else we have. But, but also, you know, the whole autoimmune pain arthritis thing, I, I think there's a lot to that in, in, in my experience. Number four, the problem relationship is always part of our present lives. So again, to the extent that your, your symptoms have something to do with the quality of your relationships, yes. And, and I think this is a, a mistake that a lot of therapists make, is that they, they focus too much on earlier relationship and past relationships instead of how you are relating to the people in your life right now. And, of course, there also are a lot of people who aren't that into relationships and they're completely fine with that 
based upon their personality tendencies. So it is quite possible for at least quite a few people to not have that many relationships or really any relationships and, and, and they still be fine. Um, number five, what happened in the past that was painful has a great deal to do with what we are today, but revisiting this painful past can contribute little or nothing to what we need to do now, improve an important present relationship. Again, I partially agree. What I tend to do is to help people to realize that the past itself is an illusion, that you don't actually experience a past or re-experience a past event, right? So, but, but, but self-reflection sometimes in the sense of looking at because you may have had certain experiences or not have had certain experiences, that you might, and, and due to your own personality tendencies, that you may be likely to respond in certain ways. You know, that can be useful self-reflection. Uh, but, but I largely agree with him that, that focusing too much on the past and people's storytelling gets in the way way more than it's useful. Uh, six, we are driven by five genetic needs, survival, love and belonging, power, freedom and fun. These needs have to be satisfied. Again, I, I think this is one of the weaknesses of his approach. Uh, and, you know, it, it, people also vary in, you know, so you take a word like fun, you know, for, for, for one person might equate that with, with laughing or having a sense of humor. For another person it might just be play, you know, playful activity or learning something new or being intellectually curious, you know. It, so this might mean very different things to, to, to different people. But again, it can be a useful model as long as you don't take it too seriously. Um, seven, we can satisfy these needs only by satisfying a picture or pictures in our quality worlds. Of all we know, what we choose to put into our quality worlds is the most important. So, so again, it's another way of saying that, you know, unless you really care about it or it's an important value for you, it won't really resonate or hit home, which is kind of true enough. You know, this kind of presupposes a bit too much that the happiness is in the relationship or kind of comes from the relationship versus more being a, a, an inside job. Um, let's see here. Number eight, all we can do from birth to death is behave. All behavior is total behavior and is made up of four inseparable components, acting, thinking, feeling, and physiology. Again, a very useful way of framing things, I think. It's way more useful to think of things in terms of now, instead of thinking of things in terms of things and nouns, to view it as processes and verbs. Um, all total behavior nine is designated by verbs. Uh, yeah, choosing to depress or depressing instead of I'm suffering from depression or I'm depressed. Um, this is extremely useful. Uh, Ten, all total behavior is chosen. We have direct control over only the acting and thinking components. We can, however, control our feelings and physiology indirectly through how we choose to act and think. So, <coughs> again, quite useful. Although, if you really explore it, we don't really choose our thoughts and feelings either. It, it kind of all just emerges. But you can make a distinction between voluntary and involuntary. But this kind of free will choosing perspective, even though if, if, if not completely accurate, is way more useful than the external control victim position that that most people uh, have. So, so again, Glasser, a very unusual psychiatrist <coughs> in that psychiatry is kind of an assault on personal freedom and personal responsibility. Um, Glasser championed freedom, choice, and responsibility. And if, if, if you want to be he would emphasize happiness and health as kind of the ability to make good choices and, and, and create a meaningful life for yourself and, and, and to have quality, healthy relationships, right? So, so focusing on, on responsibility 
is uh, a great way of, of doing that. Glasser has written a bunch of books. I've read all of them except from the books he has written on education because I don't work in that uh, realm. I highly recommend this one. Warning, psychiatry can be hazardous to your mental health. This is an excellent book. Every therapist should read this. Any home should, should have this book in terms of how you raise your kids and how you... And, and then you have his kind of flagship uh, choice theory book. And there's another one I really recommend here too, and it's called Counseling with Choice Theory. This is a great book for any psychotherapist or coach. And it's, <clears throat> it's a bunch of cases where Glasser has conversations with people who struggle with various forms of symptoms from schizophrenia, hearing voices, to migraine headaches, to obsessing, to depressing. So again, I, I hope this was useful. I'd love to hear your take on William Glasser's work, reality therapy and choice theory. Uh, you can email me or you can, you can write, write about it where you find the video. Uh, as always, know that I see clients from all over the world on Skype. If you want to work with me or see if we can be compatible as a team, you can reach me at provocativehypnosis.com. Know that I do mentoring for psychotherapists and people who explore meditation. And I'm doing seminars. My, my next seminar will be March 25th, 26th, online, the Psychological Illusion Model 2.0. Uh, it's going to be online. If you're curious about that, check out Provocative Hypnosis, the seminar page, where you have a link for information and the possibility for signing up. As always, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it.